Okay, in this video, we're going to go ahead and take a look at um, solving trigonometric equations here. And uh, it's really just going to be the infancy of these things because we're going to introduce ourselves to the inverse trigonometric functions here. So to do so, uh, what we're going to um, take a look at is just, uh, we're going to start off with this part up here before we start looking at this diagram uh, down below and then we're going to run through some other graphs that were generated on Desmos uh, to see why all of these things are what they are and how to use them. So let's start off with um, this part right here okay and so what we're looking at is the following okay the first thing that we have is something called arc sign okay and it can also be written as this right here like an inverse function the inverse sign and that is going to always equal an angle and so for example if I were to in this particular case um, say something of this sort let's take a look at this triangle right here okay is that if I wanted to know this angle here, I can say the following. The arc sine of, and if we look, this is going to be 5 opposite over hypotenuse for sine. And so the arc sine of 5 over 13, or the inverse sine of 5 over 13 is going to go ahead and give me, and we're going to need a calculator for this particular example. So um, let me cue that up. Okay, and this is in degrees. So this is going to yield at the end of the day 22 point, and I'm just going to go out to two decimal places, uh, 6 to degrees. Okay, and so let's go ahead and take a look at how this is different than sine. Okay, just regular sine. So sine, if we dropped in 30 degrees, now notice we're dropping in a degree. Okay, or we're dropping in an angle. And we're getting out, sine of 30 degrees is one half. We're getting out a ratio. And so since these are inverses, our inputs and outputs, our input for a regular sign is a degree. Our output is a ratio. So those are gonna switch for all of these guys right here. We're gonna drop in a ratio and it's gonna fetch us a degree. And that's pretty powerful uh, considering some of these degrees like five over 13 have a very peculiar um, answer or degree measure for them, okay? so. What I want to do is I'm going to back this up a little bit, so I'm going to erase that part out. And I'm going to set up um, arc cosine and arc tangent and show you how it will all go ahead and yield the same result. So let me set that up. Okay, so I have the next, the arc uh, cosine and the arc tangent uh, all set up there. And it looks like when I put them into the calculator, in the show how they got set up, okay, is that I have the cosine, which is going to be 12 over 13, adjacent over hypotenuse, okay? And then I have tangent opposite over adjacent, that's where the 5 over 12 comes from. And they're all going to equal the same thing. And so basically that means is that these things, when I go ahead and basically tell them, you know, to put it in words, any of those, is that, for example, let's just do the sine example. It says, fetch me an angle whose sine is 5 over 13, and the answer is 22.62 degrees. Same with cosine, same with tangent, okay? And so, um, that's the way that we, we start off um, understanding where or how the, these things work. Now, we're going to need some background information for this part below and um, we're going to take a look at some graphs and see uh, putting all these uh, these things together to understand 
why these graphs are what they are. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at that uh, graphical approach in the, uh, the next video. Okay, so we just looked and we used a calculator to knock these guys out. And let's see where this uh, they come from. And some of the problems that are solved by restricting some uh, domains and ranges uh, to get these things correct. Okay, so here is a graph of the sine of x. Okay, and we've seen this before. We graphed it and did all that good stuff with it, and it is just the parent function of sine of x. Now, what we're going to do is that we have the sine of x and it equals y, just like that, okay? So if we were to switch around the x and the y, okay, it would be something that looks like this. Now this over here is the sine of x equals y, okay, that guy. This in our first step of creating an inverse would be the sine of y equals x. So the way that we build an inverse function is the same way if we had this property of the um, inverse okay, function of a function. If you remember from the properties of inverses, that's going to go ahead and just equal the output there, okay? So what we're gonna do is that we're going to take the inverse sign of each side, so we will get the inverse sign of, and now we have the sign of y here, equals the inverse sign of just x, okay? And just like these two, kind of, I don't want to say cancel out, but in essence they do just to give it x. These guys are also going to undo each other, and this is just going to give us y equals the inverse sine of x. Now, here's the problem, is that this guy right here, okay, there's something wrong with it, as that is not a function, okay? And that means is that it's going to fail the vertical line test in multiple places. Also note that if we were to reflect it over the y equals x axis, the original, the, um, from going from sine to the inverse sine, right, it's going to go ahead and flip flop over here, and this is going to flip flop over here, and we end up with that reflection where the x and y values switch. So our biggest problem right now is that that inverse sine function is not a, I shouldn't say inverse sine function, inverse sine relation is not a function. And so if we take a look at it like this, okay, we see that again, this is just uh, the sine function where the x's and y's have been replaced. And you notice that it has very similar relationships to the original sine function, except now it's more vertical. And to show the problem with this thing, say if I were to go ahead and ask this guy right here, and notice that this is going to be the, um, the inverse sine function, okay? So if I were to ask, all right, well, the sin, what angle is going to go ahead and um, has the trigonometric ratio of sine of uh, one, I'm sorry, the angle whose sine is one half, okay? So that means it's going to kick out an angle. Now the bad part is, is that as is, it could kick out pi over six, five pi over six, 13 pi over six, 17 pi over six, blah, 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 blah. It goes on forever, right? Because we have the input at one half all the way down, okay, that you can see and it's going to get multiple answers. And that is not useful uh, because for one, it's not a function, and two, it could kick out anything. So mathematically, what we've done and kind of agreed on is that we trim up this part right here, okay? And let me make that a different color. We trim up this part right here so it does have that 
one-to-one -one relationship and it does pass the vertical line test like so okay so this is the recognized inverse sine function okay notice that it will pass the vertical line test and then when I ask it what is going to be the right an angle whose sine is going to be one half it has a definitive answer of pi over six or 30 degrees okay and that's super important so that basically means is that going back to this okay I'm gonna go back to the very very first page and explain to you why these are important okay is that for all of these guys and I'm gonna start right here notice that it's hedged up so this means is that I can ask the domain right here I could ask any trig to metric ratio from a negative one to a positive one okay because that's where sine bounces back in between trig to metric ratio of a negative one to a positive one and oops wrong direction Dennis and that is going to kick out any of the angles that are going to be in the fourth quadrant or the first quadrant okay because this is where the sine ratios are going to be negative and these are going to be positive so we have to go ahead and pick from those quadrants the particular um, degree measure be it degree or radians okay so for example if I were to say something of this sort to model that the sine inverse sine of a negative root 2 over 2 okay so in that case I would have to take a look at this and say all right well this is going to it has to be in between a negative 90 degrees and a positive 90 degrees so either it's going to go in this direction for positive ratios or this direction for negative ratios so I know it's negative and it's going to be in the fourth quadrant here but it's going to go in a negative pi over 4 direction and that is going to kick out negative pi over 4 or this business of a negative 45 degrees so and the reason why we do that is because again it could if we use the whole unit circle and we don't uh, restrict anything it could kick out an infinite amount of angles and therefore be useless okay now cosine does the same thing is that we can we can go ahead and pick any ratio from the uh, a negative one to a positive one because that is the range of the regular cosine function and it's going to kick out an angle that is going to be um, from 0 to 180 degrees or 0 uh, to pi simply because this is positive and this is going to go ahead and be negative all right and we couldn't go in the negative direction because that would be positive as well so if we went in, in the negative direction here that would be positive and therefore um, we would have two positives and that wouldn't make sense so for example how to use this the cosine uh the inverse cosine of let's go uh, a ratio of a negative one half okay so that means is that I say to myself what angle okay in the first or second quadrant is going to go ahead and kick um, is when I take the cosine of it is going to give me a negative one half and so I know that the cosine right is uh, when I take the cosine of uh, trying to change some colors here this pi over 3 is going to give me one uh, one half positive okay so I look over here and I think that that is going to give me what that is going to be two-thirds pi so it looks like the the cosine if I have two-thirds pi is going to give uh, when I put the negative one half into the inverse of cosine it is going to give out that or a hundred and twenty degrees just like the cosine of sixty degrees would give me one half the cosine of hundred twenty degrees would give me a negative one half so we're just switching those around 
And then finally, we have the tangent. And we know that the tangent is goes on forever in this type of fashion. So when we reflect it over the um, y equals x-axis or we do the inverse, we're going to go ahead and get this part right here. So we're only taking one um, increment of the asymptotes that are uh, kind of like butterflied around the, um, the y-axis and then turn to the x-axis for the inverse, okay? And it has the same choices for the angles, okay? So, for example, if I were to say this business of what is going to be um, the inverse tangent of, and let's just make this easy, a negative one. So I know that tangent is going to be um, one either here or here, but uh, this is going to be a positive 45 degrees or pi over four for the positive uh, one, and this is going to be a negative pi over four for the negative one. So I pick from the fourth quadrant, and that is going to be a negative pi over four or a negative 45 degrees, okay? So um, that's, how you, uh, that's how you do that guy. Um, and in the next video, we're going to uh, take a little bit more in-depth look at uh, these and using um, this uh, chart below. And uh, yeah, I'll see you in the next video. Okay, uh, this is one of the first steps uh, to solving a trigonometric equation. And uh, we're basically going to look at what happens when we have this, the trigonometric uh, ratio of some angle equals a number. Okay, So our first example is going to go ahead and be the sine of theta equals 1 half. Now that is a known value. So we think to ourselves okay, that we can say theta equals whatever angle that we go ahead and take the sine of one half of, or I'm sorry, whatever angle that when we take the sine of it, it equals a negative one half. That said, is that it is going to live in here based on our um, classroom adventures of the domain and range of arc sine or the inverse sine. So we're picking an angle that is going to equal a negative. Um, when we take the sine of it, it's going to equal a negative one half. But we know it has to be in this area right here because that's where cosine is positive. And so we think, okay, well, what angle, when I go ahead and take the sine of it, it's going to equal a negative one half. That's in that shaded region. Um, it looks like we can safely say that it's going to be this guy right here. Okay. And it looks like that is going to be a negative 30 degrees or a negative pi over 6. And so theta will equal a negative pi over 6. Now notice we can do that without a calculator because these are known values. And what we're going to do is switch gears and see what happens when we have to use a calculator. Okay, this next one is it's asking us to find what angle in radians that when we take the sine of it, it's going to be a negative 3 fifths. And so far, um, we're just working in this area because we know that, that is the domain and range of what we get to go ahead and pick from uh, arc sine. So therefore, we're looking for that angle. However, we notice that that is not a nice value. That is, is that usually the values that we know are going to be 0, 1 half, root 2 over 2, root 3 over 2, etc., etc., 1 that are going to be known values of sine. So what we have to do on this particular case is that we have to uh, use our, our calculator, scientific or otherwise, that is going to fetch this number for us. And so we know that the, uh, the, the radian degree is going to be somewhere in here. And this is an estimation. I don't really know what it is. But as I punch it into my calculator, it looks like theta is going to be a negative 0. 644 four radians. And so, in cases like that, we have to use our graphing calculators or scientific calculators to fetch the angle that we need. This next example is that when we're trying to find theta, 
Um, one, we're not sure if Theta really exists. And to go ahead and take a look at this thing, is that um, we're saying we take the sine of Theta, whatever angle that is, and it equals 3 over 2. However, the problem is, is that when we look at sine, just in its parent form here, um, we are looking at it, it only goes from 1 to a negative 1. And those are all the values all the way here through 2 pi. That said is that there is not going to be any value of theta that is going to give us 3 over 2 up here. That is, is that the sine wave doesn't reach that. So there's no input that's going to give us um, 3 over 2. So therefore, in this case, there's going to be no solution. And if you put this into your calculator, I'm quite sure um, it will give you something of uh, error or domain error, etc., etc. And that's your immediate uh, cue that, hey, this happens to have no solution here. Our next one has to do with tangent. And tangent, we changed the game a little bit because we have these guys over here to go ahead and pick from. So these are the angles that we can fetch using arc tangent. So um, we think to ourselves here, okay, well, what value um, or what angle do I take the tangent of and it gives me 3 over 2? That's not a known value right? because we know that tangent's values are going to be 0, uh, square root of 3, 1, square root of 3 over 3 are undefined. So therefore, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at what we got going on. So um, what we're going to have to do is take the inverse tangent here and uh, find out what that is going to equal. And so it looks like that's going to be approximately uh, point, uh, oops, one second, 0 0.983, rounding to the nearest thousand. Okay, our final example is one of those reciprocal type deals. And what you want to do is to, um, to put this in terms of sine, cosine, or tangent uh, just by using some algebra. And when I have it to this level, uh, what I use is that you can go ahead and flip uh, this entire thing upside down on both sides uh, to make it a, uh, a true statement. So let, let's go ahead and do that. So we're going to flip this upside down. And I would have 1 over secant of theta equals 2 over 1. Okay. Now, 1 over secant of theta uh, from our 15 and 10, if you will, is going to go ahead and be cosine of theta equals 2. So what angle do I take the cosine of to give me 2? Uh, this is one of those examples that it would be way up here, is that we know that cosine only goes from 1 to a negative 1. And therefore, trying to get cosine to go to a positive 2 is impossible. And so therefore, there's going to be no solution. And like the third example there, you could plug this into your calculator, and you will see that it will give you something um, that is going to be along the line of, hey, it doesn't exist. So, um, that's the beginning stages of solving trigonometric equations, and uh, that's how you do that. Thank you for watching. All right, with these next problems, a little bit of a departure from uh, the last video that we looked at when we were finding the inverse of uh, these particular trig ratios. But what we're looking at is we're finding all of the solutions of the following. And all the solutions uh, means is that we have a blank check to operate outside of the, um, the standard issue of the inverse sine, inverse tangent, inverse cosine, etc., etc. So let's go ahead and take a look at this first one, how we're going to uh, do this out, and uh, see where this takes us. First thing we want to do is that we want to get all the trigonometric ratio on one side and all the constants on the other. So I'm going to add sine x to both sides and I'm going to throw 
the uh, square root of 2 over on this side. And that's going to give me 2 sine of x equals a negative square root of 2. And then, uh, to finish things off, I'm going to divide each side by the square root of 2. And it's going to be sine x equals a negative square root of 2 over 2. Okay. Now, here's the deal, is that we're looking for the angle x. When we take the sine of it, it's going to give us a negative square root of 2 over 2. So we know that it can't exist here because sine is positive. We know it can't exist here because sine is positive. It has to exist here or here. So, therefore, we have to think about what angle is going to give us a sine. When we take the, uh, the sine of it, it's going to give us square root of 2 over 2. And it's going to be over here, because that'll be negative, and it'll be over here. Um, and again, these are based on our reference angles and whatnot we'll be practicing class. So I know, and I'm going to color code these different, that this angle right here is going to give us negative square root of 2 over 2 when we take the sine of it, and also this angle when we take the, when we take the inverse sine of it. It's going to give us a negative square root. 2 over 2. So let's look at the the blue angle first. We know that the first time that it hits a negative square root of 2 over 2 is going to be 5 pi over 4 because that's what that angle is. Now we know that it's going to hit 5 pi over 4 again when we go around here and we go 2 pi radians around and every two pi radians around, we go ahead and hit that particular angle. So we put two pi n, where n is an integer, to go ahead and make up for all the angles. So we can find them all just based on this particular um, little uh, algorithm that we wrote for uh, finding x. For the purple values, is that we know that x is going to be 7 pi over 4. And that is going to go ahead and hit every time that we go around here, 2 pi. So 7 pi over 4 plus 2 pi, which is the turnaround um, in radians of a, um, just basically one turnaround from there, where n is an integer. So this would be the entire answer set for that particular equation because again we can find any angular measure in radians that satisfies that equation um, based on these two algorithms that we went ahead and built even though they're outside of the range of arc sine. So uh, that's how you do that, and thank you for watching. Okay, this next one um, is like the uh, the sine stuff that we just went ahead and did. Uh, we need to get tangent all of x all by itself, and we need to go ahead and get all the numbers all by themselves as well. So that's it, is that I'm going to add 1 uh, to each side, and afterwards I'm going to divide by 3. So, I'm going to get the tangent squared of x equals one-third. And then, I need to take um, the square root of both sides, because that's what we need to do to get rid of the square root. And that's going to give me the tangent of x equals, now this is very important, plus or minus the square root of one-third. Now, to rationalize this out, we know that we don't like the square root of 3 on the bottom, so I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by the square root of 3, and at the end of the day, our last step is going to be the tangent of x is going to give us plus or minus the square root of 3 over 3, which is great because that's a known value. So now we go to work. We think to ourselves, when I take the tangent of some angle, it gives me the positive square root of 3 over 3 or the negative square root of 3 over 3. And we know that that is going to occur here 
when I know that it's going to be uh, 30 degrees or pi over 6. This guy, which is another reference angle of pi over 6. This angle, which is a pi over, uh, a reference angle of pi over 6. And this angle. So basically, we have um, all these stops that could satisfy this equation. So let's take a look. Let's, and I'm going to, for the moment, take a look at that guy. So we know that x is going to equal pi over 6 the first time it satisfies that equation. However, if we look with this one turn around here, is that halfway through the turn of the unit circle, it's going to hit again for this guy. So that means is that it's going to, every pi, repeat itself. Pi, and again etc. So that basically means that I only have to put pi over 6 plus pi n oops ah. stop it stop it okay where n is an integer for that those particular values and likewise, when I look over here, and I see, oh, I'm trying to find another, something that's a vastly different color here, this angle, okay, now this angle over here is going to be uh, 3 pi over 4, okay, and x equals 3 pi, I'm sorry, it's not 3 pi over 4, I apologize, it is 5 pi over 6. So 5 pi over 6 is going to give us that first value that's going to satisfy that equation. And when I go around here, this is going to be another pi distance halfway around the unit circle that is going to satisfy this thing. So it's going to be plus pi n, where n is an integer, okay? And so that's kind of a strange solution to this guy, but um, that's the way that that thing works out. And we're looking for the uh, the first time that it actually hits, okay? That is, is that it, it completes the, the statement in a correct way, and then when does it do it again? For the blue angle, it did it every pi, and for the green angle, it did it every pi as well. So therefore, we know that whatever value that I plug in for n, it's going to kick out a correct solution that is going to satisfy our original guy, which is over here. So, all right, um, that's how you do that, and thank you for watching. Okay, this uh, this final example here is uh, is going to go ahead, and the one that's in blue um, has some stuff going on it. We're going to use the uh, zero product property. Uh, to knock this thing out. And uh, why we have to use a zero product property is that we notice that we have cotangent on both sides of the equation. And many students make this mistake by saying, I'm going to divide through by cotangent x. However, uh, that would be incorrect because you end up losing answers. Uh, you don't want a variable to completely go away and just be left with cosine squared x um, equals in this case too. Uh, so that would be incorrect. What we do want to do is that we want to move everything to one side. So I'm going to choose to go ahead and move all the cotangent stuff to the left-hand side here. Like that. And I'm going to start way back up here to give us some room. And this is going to give us the cotangent of x times the cosine squared of x minus 2 cotangent x equals 0. So now what I need to do is that I need to factor out that part right there so I can have a product of two things uh, equal to 0 so I can apply the zero product property. So this is going to give me cotangent x times whatever's left over cosine squared x minus 2. So again, I'm taking this and I'm factoring it out in front uh, like 
there, right? So those, that guy is going to um, come out in front and be right here. So now the trick is, is that we got these um, equal to zero. So I can set both of these equal to zero and start to go ahead and craft my answer from there. So, oops, forgot to set that equal to zero. So now uh, that they're both equal to zero, and these are, even though I put them kind of close to one another, um, this is going to be that, that guy right there, and then this is this guy right here. Okay, so I want to solve both these out. So now I have to think, okay, for cotangent, I want to find all the instances in which uh, that that's going to go ahead and be zero. So one of the ways that we can think about is, well, co we know that cotangent at, um, basically at zero degrees is going to be undefined. And it might, you might want to go ahead and sometimes think about the graph when we have tangent and cotangent. And if you look, right, it starts undefined at zero, and in its parent form at pi, it goes back to um, undefined. So we got undefined at zero, the asymptote, and then we have undefined at pi. So it's going to go ahead and make sense that the angle that is going to give cotangent, uh, make cotangent go to zero is going to be right in between those two, and that's going to be pi over two. So this guy right here. And we know that this is going to give us the undefined and the undefined for cotangent, and it's going to repeat itself. So we'd go pi over two, and then it's going to repeat itself again when we come back down here and go three pi over two. So it looks like every half turn around the circle, it's going to give us another solution. So what we would say is x equals pi over 2 plus pi n, where n is an integer. Is an integer for that part of the solution. And that itself would be one part. So now we have to analyze the second part right here. And so, um, what we want to do is that we want to start working this thing out, and we would have uh, cosine x equals, two, I'm sorry, cosine squared x equals 2. We take the square root of both sides, and we would get the cosine of x equals plus or minus the square root of 2. Now, in this case, we know that there's no angle that we could plug in for x that is going to give us the square root of 2. Um, it's going to give us the square root of 2 over 2, but that's not what we're looking for. And therefore, this is, the square root of 2 is going to be out of our cosine's range, and therefore we would have um, no solution for this part. Now, it's only for that part. Um, so that means is that this to put the pieces together is just nonsensical because I can't go ahead and get the, uh, the solution for this. So the only solution that I'm worried about and the final solution would be this guy right here. x um, equals pi over 2 plus pi n where n is an integer simply because the cotangent x equals 0 is the only part of this product right here that happens to have a solution. So that's how you do that, and uh, thank you for watching. Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, solve this one uh, out, and these uh, require a little bit more finesse, if you will. And we also have to keep in mind that we're solving this time over an interval, which means is that we don't need all answers, we just need the answers that are in this particular interval, which is 0, including 0, all the way to 2 pi. And we're solving everything in radians. So the first thing that we want to do is that we want to take a look at this guy and realize that it's kind of like a, a quadratic imposter. And so, for example, if I were to take all the sine x's, right, and um, I would let uh, sine of x equal, uh, let's just have it equal t. Um, 
then I could rewrite this thing as 2 t squared minus t minus 1. And from here, we could go ahead and solve this by factoring, uh, theoretically, assuming that it factors out. So what we can do is this is at a, well, let's, let's go ahead and factor this thing. And we say what two numbers multiply um, 2, oops, uh, yeah, we can't do it quite like that. Let's just use our standard guess and check. Um, is that we'd have 2 in front there. We know t has to go here. So it looks like this is going to be a minus 1 and a plus 1. So just using, again, your standard reverse foil or factoring technique. Uh, we couldn't use the other way that I started it on because it, had, it doesn't have a leading coefficient of, uh, of 1, and I didn't want to go through all that one. Looks like pretty much some armchair mathematics. So now, if I substitute sine back in, I can get 2 sine x plus 1. Parentheses, uh, let's see, sine x minus 1 equals 0. Okay, so... Now we're at the stage where we have the product of two things, and we can use the zero product property to finish this thing off. So now I'm going to go ahead and say, all right, the first one is going to be sine, or I'm sorry, 2 sine x uh, plus 1 equals 0, and then we have sine x minus 1 equals 0. And uh, what we do is that we get sine all by itself, and so we're going to have sine x equals a negative 1 half, uh, after we subtract 1 and divide by 2, and sine x equals 1. So what we want to do is that we want to think about where the, these are going to occur um, one time around the unit circle, okay? So let's work on this right here. We know that we're taking uh, the sine of some angle and we're getting a negative one half out. So we know if we take all students, take calculus, um, that we want to go ahead and find some reference angles that are going, when we take the sine of that angle, it's going to be negative. And so that's going to occur right here with a 30 degree reference angle and right here with a 30 degree reference angle. So it looks like that the two angles that are going to work, the first one is going to be this guy, which should be uh, 30 degrees more than um, than one turn around or half a turn around, which is going to be pi. So it looks like the first one would be seven pi over six, and the other one should go ahead and be all the way around here, which is going to be 11 pi. Uh, oops, made my 11 into a pi. Um, 11 pi over 6. And that is just going to go ahead and be the first two answers. Uh, because we're looking at only one turn around the circle. We don't have to keep going. Uh, that is, is that as soon as we go this little bit more, we're beyond that 2 pi right here. And it it's not necessary because we're only looking for these particular um, angles that are one positive turnaround. Next, we're looking for where sine is 1. Um, and sine is 1, and it appears, uh, well, let's, let's go ahead and think about that. Uh, I think the only place that we're going to be able to find it is right here, okay? Uh, strictly because when we go like this, the sine of 90 degrees... Oh, or pi over 2, is going to be 1, and the 1 down here would give us a negative, um, and we don't want that. So, the final solution is going to go ahead and be, hang on, let me get that, pi over 2. And so, these are the three instances that, um, the three angles that are going to, um, when you plug them into this original guy right here, that's going to give us 0. So, that's basically what we found. Okay, so that's how you do that, and uh, thank you for watching. Okay, in this video, we're going to go ahead and um, 
we're going to solve the purple one here. And uh, this guy has a little bit of a, a trick to it because uh, what's different um, than the previous example that we, uh, we just saw is that we have sine and cosine in the same equation, and uh, they're kind of mixed up. Kind of looks like a quadratic, uh, like the other one. However, it's not because we have two different things going on. So that means is that we need to go ahead and uh, do a switch, the first thing. So what we want to do is that um, since this guy is squared, it might be easiest for us to go ahead and use the fact that uh, we got sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, and therefore we can say that sine squared equals 1 minus cosine squared. And then we can put that in for this guy and now have everything in terms of cosine. So therefore, let's, let's do that out and see where this takes us. So we got 2, 1 minus cosine squared x plus 3 cosine x minus 3 and um, using the dis distributive property and just kind of rearranging this entire thing uh, let's uh, we can do some of this in our head here is that we're going to get a negative to uh, cosine x uh, so we're going to get a positive 2 and this negative 3 here so that's going to give me a negative 1 at the end so I would have 3 cosine x and then a minus 1 equals 0. Okay, so one of the tricks when you're factoring something that looks like a quadratic, um, which is the same as the, again, this guy that we just did, is that I don't like that negative in front uh, makes factoring sometimes, uh, I don't know, I make careless errors with it. So what I do, and this is a legal move, is to just multiply the whole thing by a negative 1. And that way, uh, that's going to flip all the signs, and we're going to have something a little bit easier to work with, at least in my opinion. If you don't mind a negative, then uh, kudos to you, and um, it'll work out the exact same way. Okay. Now, this only works when it's all set up and equal to 0 or another thing. You can multiply through by a negative 1 to switch the signs, and nothing else. If it were equal to y and it were like a function or an equation um, that you're graphing, uh, wouldn't work out so nicely. So, so don't do that. So now um, we're going to go ahead and we imagine that uh, this guy, and I'm just going to make the t substitution, that this is going to be 2 t squared minus 3 t uh, plus 1 equals 0. And so now I can just use some armchair mathematics, and I can say that this is going to be 2t, um, and a t right here, and it looks like these both going to have to be negative, for, and then equal to 0. So just checking our work real quick in our head, and it looks like we got it. So it appears now I have 2 cosine, <coughs> pardon me, x minus 1 times cosine of x minus 1 equals 0. So we're back to um, this exercise where we're trying to get uh, the angles that are going to satisfy these things once we go ahead and do them out um, and one turn around the circle. So after we set these equal to 0, I'm going to get 2 co oops, not whatever the heck I just wrote, 2 cosine x minus 1 equals 0 and cosine again using the zero product property that's why we're trying we factored it so we can use it out and so therefore i would have cosine of x equals one half and cosine of x equals one okay so we're looking for the angles one turn around um the circle here that are going to again satisfy this so we think all right uh all students take calculus where are these angles hiding so we're taking the cosine of some angle x so we know it has to be positive so that this first one has to be hiding um, in the first quadrant and the fourth quadrant so it looks like the first occurrence is going to be uh, pi over 3 which is going to be the 30 degrees take the uh, cosine of 30 degrees you get positive one half 
Uh, that's also going to happen way down over here. Um, so we got this angle and then this one coming way around here. And that is going to be 5 pi over 3. And it looks like uh, anything else we're going further will be out of uh, that range that we're looking for. So our first part of the answers are going to be x equals uh, pi over 3 comma, uh, let's see, 5 pi over 3. And now we just need to go fetch where cosine equals 0. Um, now we've got to be tricky here because you notice that, um, and if you look in the upper right hand corner, what I'm writing here, is that this includes 0 and this does not include 2 pi, so you can't double up on it. So therefore, the only time that in this, uh, in this particular interval that the cosine of some angle is going to equal 1 is going to be at 0 radians, uh, not 2 pi. Two, well, at 2 pi it does, but it will be out of the, um, the particular interval that we're looking for. And so that would be our, our final solution here. So it looks like um, those are the only three angles that satisfy our equation. And, uh, and that's that. So um, that's how you do that, and thank you for watching. Okay, the final one on the page, the, uh, the green one, um, is just going to go ahead and, uh, and be something where we are looking at it and we're going, oh, boy, uh, sure would be nice if this is, wasn't here, this 2x, okay? Or, or if it were set up differently, because right now, we don't really have any way uh, to battle this thing or factor anything out, etc., etc. So what we're going to do is that we're going to call on, uh, before we, we go any further, is the double angle formula for sine, where we're going to go sine of 2x equals 2 sine x cosine x. So, um, and then we're going to throw that in for this entire guy and see what happens. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look. So I go 2 cosine of x plus, and instead of writing sine of 2x, I'm going to use this. And now we have something that is doable. And uh, so at this point, um, I want to use the same uh, techniques from a couple of slides ago. We're factoring out something that's in common. It uh, looks like we can grab a 2 and a cosine uh, from each one of those. And so let's go so 2 cosine x out in front, um, 1 plus sine x equals 0. Okay. So again, we're just factoring out those two things, and now we use the zero product property again. So, we have 2 cosine of x equals 0, and 1 plus the sine of x equals 0. So, um, what we're doing is that we're getting these uh, all by themselves, and so we have the cosine. We just divide each side by 2, so we just have really the cosine uh, of x equals 0, because when we divide by 2 on both sides, that, that's just going to fall off, 0 divided by 2 is, is 0. So this is the equation um, that we're most, uh, uh, you know, uh, interested in. And then I'm going to subtract 1 from each side over here, and I get sine x equals negative 1. And these two, well, again, we play that game of uh, where are the angles hiding. So. We get this uh, part all set up, we get all students take calculus, and we think about, okay, well, where's this first one at? The cosine of zero. I'm sorry, the cosine of some angle that equals zero. Well, it looks like we're going to have two of them because this angle right here, uh, pi over two, is going to go ahead and work as well as, I believe, um, this angle right here. And so this is going to work as well. So we'd have 3 pi over 2. And so those are two angles that happen to fall within our interval that are going to work for this, uh, that first particular uh, equation. And so we have, so far, x equals pi over 2, comma, 
three pi over two, and I think you're going to hear my dog in a moment because it looks like it wants to get on the couch. So if you hear some some jumping, then um, that's that's George. Anyway, uh, so now I have the sine of a negative one, and the sine of a negative one uh, looks like it's doubling up here because this is uh, not the sine of a negative one, the sine of some angle that equals a negative one. It's going to go ahead and be right here because um, that's the only place that that's going to occur. However, we've already counted that in, and so we don't need to count it twice. And so therefore, these are going to be our only solutions that are in the interval of uh, 0 to 2 pi, where 0 is included and 2 pi is not, uh, that is going to satisfy the set equation. So that's how you do that, and uh, thank you for watching. Okay, with these last couple ones, uh, this is going to go ahead and... Uh, we're going to take a look at solving uh, the multiple angle equations um, when we're not using identities here. And just kind of like taking a, a cleaner look at this thing. So what we do is that um, the first thing, it, it seems kind of weird to, to say this, but the first thing that we do is that we're going to go ahead and we're going to do a substitution. And we're just going to call T3X so we can get a cleaner approach on this thing. And so let's take a look at how that will change the scope of the equation. So we got the cosine of t, uh, 2 uh, cosine of t minus 1 equals 0. And then we set this thing up and we get the cosine of t equals 1 half. Okay. So doing like uh, we did with the other problems, we went ahead and we said, okay, well, um, let's take a look at finding all, and let's, uh, let's, Let's do this for all solutions, okay? Um, so, if we're doing the all solutions, that means is that we're going to have to have that that n uh, factor in there because there's going to uh, likely be uh, an infinite amount of them. So, at any rate, um, what angle t that when you take the cosine of it is going to be one half? And so, again. We look, all students take calculus, and it looks like we have this guy right here, which is going to be pi over 3. Okay, and it looks like the other one is going to be over here, which is going to do one turn around the circle here, and that's going to be, um, let's see, uh, 5 pi over 3. <coughs> Pardon me. So it looks like the only way that we can go ahead and get these to match up is it looks like um, that when, and I'm just going to go ahead and start from this angle right here, the only time it hits nicely is that if I add 2 pi to it uh, every single time. So my first solution is going to go ahead and be t equals pi over 3 plus 2 pi n, where n is an integer, okay? And I'm going to leave that out, the rest of that out for the time being. And the next part, uh, I'm going to take a look at this guy, starting from the 5 pi over 3, and when I swish, oops, did something weird here, swish this all the way around, it looks like it's going to hit again nicely every 2 pi increment. And so I would have t equals 5 pi over 3 plus... 2 pi n, where n is an integer. Now, this is where we got to go ahead and make the switches to uh, finish things off. Because we're not looking for t, because the original problem asks for x. And so I substitute back in 3x for t, and I get 3, uh, uh, 3x uh, equals uh, pi divided by 3 plus 2 pi n, where n is an integer. And to finish this thing off, um, I want x all by itself, so I'm going to multiply. I'm going to yeah multiply the entire thing by one third, so I can go ahead and get that three to cancel out. So I'm going to multiply one third in each one of those, and my first answer is going to be x equals uh, because the threes will cancel out, and I will get pi over nine plus two pi. Uh, over 3n, and then I'll finish this off, because it's complete now, where n is an integer. Okay? And we have to do the same thing uh, to finish off this guy over here. 
And so we're going to have this where we have t, where we got 3. Instead of writing t, I'm going to write 3x equals 5 pi over 3 plus 2n, where n is an integer. And like I did in the lines before, I'm going to multiply each side by one third, or the whole thing rather. And multiply that in using distributive property, and that's going to give me x equals 5 pi over 9 plus 2 pi divided by 3n, where n is an integer. Okay. So both of these guys are going to be the final solutions, and it seems kind of uh, kind of bizarre to, to play things out like that, but it works, and it keeps us from using um, a bunch of identities that are going to be tough to to work with. So um, that's how you do that, and uh, thank you for watching. Okay, um, in this video, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, take a look at another one of these multiple angle examples without using any of these uh, um, uh, trig identities or anything. And we're going to go ahead and find all the solutions, and we're going to find the solutions that are going to be from 0 to 2 pi. I think in the last video I made, I forgot the 0 to 2 pi part. So we're going to be covering it here and uh, just come up with a strategy how to uh, find, again, all solutions and all the solutions from 0, including 0, all the way to 2 pi, not including it. So first thing that we want to do is, uh, like we did in the, uh, the last video, is that we have this multiple angle. And to make things easier on ourselves, we're going to replace that with a dummy variable. I'm just going to use t, as we often do, and rewrite this thing um, so it looks like something that we can solve out nicely. Okay. Oops. And now I'm going to uh, throw the 3 on the other side, giving us a negative 3, and divide by 3. That's the in front of the tangent there. And I'm going to get the tangent of t equals a negative 1. Okay. So where does, if I take uh, the tangent of a particular angle, um, where is it going to give me a negative 1? So we got um, all of these things here. So we're looking where tangent is negative 1. And we know that it is going to be a 45 degree angle. Okay. Oops. Uh, why did I put an A down there? That's silly. Um, where it's going to be negative in the second quadrant and in the fourth quadrant. So, uh, because we know that the tangent of 45 degrees is 1, and, or the tangent of pi over 4 is 1, and so therefore um, it is going to want to be negative in quadrant 2 or quadrant 4, as we studied before. So, the first angle, right, that is going to give us our, one of our solutions is going to be 3 pi over 4, okay? Now, uh, this is one of those cases that we're fortunate that it looks like the next one is going to give us, going all the way around here, it looks like it is going to be, um, let's see, where am I at here? I'm trying to find the colors here. Uh, 7 pi over 4, okay? So this angle out there, the whole thing is going to give me 7 pi over 4 going all in that direction. So that said, is that it looks like it's going to hit every pi increments um, like we saw in the last um, videos. So for example, again, um, it is going to go uh, 3 pi over 4, then in pi radians it's going to hit with another solution, pi more radians it's going to hit another solution, pi more radians it's going to hit with another solution, etc, etc. So the way that we want to write this, at least in the interim, is t is going to equal the first positive solution, 3 pi over 4, plus every increment that it is going to hit uh, or to the next solution, which is going to be pi n. And I'm going to leave that uh, for the moment because we're about to do some algebra with it. We have to switch back n, x divided by 3, and for t, uh, because we're asked about x, we're not asked about what we made up there. 
So I got x divided by 3 equals 3 pi over 4 plus pi n. And then we want to multiply the entire thing by 3 in order to get rid of the 3 that's attached to the x. So after using uh, the distributive property, we're going to end up with x equals 9 pi over 4 plus 3 pi n. Okay, and now we can write where n is an integer. Okay, so that is going to take care of the all section. All right, um, that is our all solution. Now, to go on to um, this part right here, which is going to be over 0 to 2 pi, what we can do is that we can test values of n and see which ones are going to be included with that guy right there. So we can go test values of n. Let's start off simple and let's just uh, test, um, let's see, n equals 0 is a safe one. So if I test n equals 0 into my equation here that I built, that is going to be revealing all the solutions. I get the zero right here, and that's gonna give me nine pi over um, four, which is, yikes, that is gonna be too big um, because that is going to give me um, two and one quarter pi. That's gonna be out of the range, or out of the, um, the domain or the picks, the restrictions there for that guy. So, ooh, um, so that looks like automatically we got to go in the other direction because if we plug values in that are going to be like n equals one, n equals two, we're just going to get larger and larger, and it's we have no chance to get that into the uh, the range or the uh, the domain that we need. So, um, let's plug in a negative one and see what shakes loose here. So, let's see, we got three pi, and now we got this business of a negative one, okay? And just doing out some of the arithmetic. Oop, that's gonna be a minus sign, isn't it? Okay. And uh, over one, um, I'm going to use uh, that crisscross technique real quick. So I'm going to get 9 pi minus 12 pi. I don't like the looks of that already. Uh, or 4. So that is going to give me, yikes, um, <laughs> again, a negative 3 pi over 4. So over this, if I were to say that's out, uh, that's uh, less than zero. So it looks like there is going to be a solution here for all solutions were fine. But over this guy, there are no values uh, that are going to um, be within that range. So there's going to be no solution over 0 to 2 pi. And so to show that, graphically um, I just generated a Desmos graph and I cut off the uh, the other one that was going to be over here but it looks like we have this and you can see from oops from 0 to 2 pi we have nothing going on there because we wanted all the values that were going to generate 0 which is like an x-intercept we don't have any so um, sometimes that happens so uh, that's how you do that and um, test for the values that are going to be over an interval. And um, next video, we're going to take a look at um, how to solve things that uh, are going to be uh, too algebraically intense. So we're going to have to use this business of technology. So see you then. Okay. So for these guys, um, what we're looking at is this business of um, we can't solve them um, algebraically uh, just because they are they're pretty crazy looking if you look at them uh, you know this guy and this guy it's just like oh my gosh um, where to even start and so what we're gonna do is that we want to bring up uh, the fact that when we have um, our graphic technology that we can let okay the one of these equal y sub 1 in our 
graph and one of these y sub 2 in our graph and their points of intersection are going to be um, the x values are going to be the solutions. So let's take a look at, I didn't sketch the graph, I'm, I'm just going to bring up the graph that we, uh, in Desmos here. So here's the graph of this first one on the left hand side and we are looking for all the values again um, 0 to 2 pi. So we're looking for where the graphs meet over these guys right here. So it looks like the only x value that is going to be correct here is going to be that guy, okay? So the solution to that is going to be, for the first one, um, x equals, and I forgot what that was, uh, 2.646, 2.646. And we would have to do that by just graphing it out. Um, really no other way to, uh, to knock that out at this point. So sometimes you get um, one solution uh, like that and sometimes for this next one on the right hand side involving tangent you get something a bit more convoluted uh, which is going to be this guy. And so we have including zero here all the way to two pi and it looks like you know you got this weird tangent thing going on there in purple and then the parabola so it looks like we have one two three four solutions okay and so um to do this thing out uh, let's go ahead i'm going to just list them out that x equals zero i'm not going to go back to the other page uh, i'm sure you get the point by now uh, x equals 1.129, x equals 3.035, and x equals 4.825. So anytime that you get something that is uh, way crazy and looks like the boogeyman here, um, you can just use your graphing calculator to banish it away and uh, find the solutions like that. Um, and so that's how you do that, and uh, thanks for watching. Okay, in the next couple of videos, what we're going to do is that we're going to take a look at uh, creating some trigonometric uh, functions here. And uh, we're going to then uh, use our graphing calculator or graphing program uh, to kind of like maximize or minimize um, anything that we are uh, trying to find based on an angle. And so uh, the first example one that I want to talk about is this business of a lifeguard, okay? So say that you are a lifeguard, and I'm paraphrasing what is written above. And you see somebody over here in the bottom right-hand corner, and they are having a rough day, okay? They are being attacked by a killer goldfish. And so the swimmer, um, it looks like he's going to be about 120 feet from the shore, okay? And um, it says the lifeguard is in a station 300 feet down the beach, which is going to go ahead right from, so this distance right here, okay, to if you were to make a perpendicular line on over to the swimmer, okay? So that said, uh, something that we want to make sure that is going to be super important to solving this problem, because I, I did a lot of labeling and whatnot in the diagram, but we want to make sure that we can run, all right, or we know that we can run, um, and that is going to be 13 feet uh, per second, okay, and we know that we can swim at 5 feet per second. So, how is this going to uh, play into things, um, and I'm going to show you that in a minute here. <clears throat> so, basically, what we want to do is that um, it asks us some questions, and I want to go after the angle first because, after all, this is uh, you know a, a topic in trigonometry. So let's go after the uh, the angle, and the angle basically means is that we want to um, minimize the amount of time it's going to uh, this guy right here, okay, the uh, um, the person that is going to run down the uh, shoreline here, and then eventually they're going to have to jump into the water to save that person okay and that's going to make a triangle of sort and so what we got to do is that we got to take it in um into consideration that they can run faster than they can swim so if the person just dove right in 
like that, um, that would go pretty slow uh, because they can only reach at five feet per second, or they can only swim at five feet per second. And they don't want to go all the way down, right? Because we're going extra time they, that they could be diving into the water. Wouldn't want to go all the way perpendicular to the person and then dive in because you would be running for too long. So basically it's looking at, well, what is the sweet spot um, that you're going to run down the shore and uh, dive in at some particular angle to save that person using the least amount of time. And what we want to do is that we want to um, build this function in terms of uh, time, in terms of theta, okay? And we want to minimize that out. So um, let's go ahead and put some pieces together and get to work. Okay, so to do this out, what we're gonna do is we wanna label some, uh, some parts here. And what I want to do, and I'm gonna put all the new stuff uh, here in green, is that I wanna go after this distance right here, okay? Or I shouldn't say go after, but name that X, okay? And so that means is that um, this right here, when he's, or, or she, is gonna be running towards the person that is having a hard time with the killer goldfish, this distance right here is going to be 300 minus X. And then, um, because the total distance right here is 300, okay? So that said, <clears throat> is that at some point, they're going to wanna dive in and travel this distance. So what we wanna do is that we wanna find uh, the hypotenuse there, the length of the hypotenuse in terms of X uh, so we can start to knock that thing out. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and apply the Pythagorean theorem. It seems like it's the, uh, the most, uh, might be the most reasonable way to go. Okay, so the Pythagorean theorem, um, looking at what I wrote here, uh, basically is going to, we wanted to find, I just labeled that distance d, and it's going to equal uh, the square root of the sum of the square of those sides, just like the Pythagorean theorem would work, okay? So, um, that said, is that we can start putting the pieces together, and to do so, one of the things that we also have to understand is that we're trying to minimize time. And so with time, we're going to go ahead and have to go distance equals rate times time, because right now we're just dealing with distances and we have some rates right here. So if I want time, I'm going to go ahead and have to divide through by the rate, and that's gonna give me time equals a distance divided by a rate, okay? So let's see how this plays out. Okay, so let's start in a very um, straightforward format, okay? Is that I want these two parts right here, so the time it's going to take this person is uh, to run down the, uh, the shore and go from here in here, okay, because that's what we're trying to minimize, is that we know that 300 minus X is a distance, okay, that's in feet. So I got 300 minus X, and how, f and how fast can I run as a rate? That's going to be 13 feet, right, per second. So this is going to give me time because this is the distance and this is the rate and that's gonna kick out of time. Now, we know that the person also has to travel this distance right here. And so um, that distance divided by a rate, so let's go ahead and put the distance up there. So we got the square root of the sum of 120 squared plus x squared all over this business of five because that's how fast the person could swim, okay? So that is gonna be time with respect to X. However, what we want is time with respect to theta. So now what we're gonna do is that we're going to concentrate on creating, um, tr trying to get X in terms of theta so we can turn all those X's into thetas and then um, find out which angle is going to give us the best results in the quickest time to get into our poor guy that's a person that is being uh, snarfed up by this killer goldfish here. 
Okay, so concentrating on the triangle um, right here, we just want to say, all right, well, theta in terms of x, um, we want to play into theta. We want to go ahead and work in the opposite side, and we want to work in this adjacent side. So I can write, okay, and I'm just going to get rid of that little Pythagorean theorem bit here, and then write the tangent of theta equals 120 over x, okay? So, um, in this case, it looks like then I would have x equals 120 divided by the tangent of theta. And an easier way to write this um, what can be x equals 120 cotangent theta. Okay, just so we don't have a fraction. So that means is that each one of these x's over here, we could put in a cotangent theta, okay, from here and here. And so we can write a new formula that's going to look like this. Okay, from here you can see that we have um, the 100 cotangent of theta replaced in for x and um, before we turn this over to our graphing calculator, I'm going to do the, a little bit of simplifying because in upper level classes, you'll have to simplify this down as much as you can uh, in order to make it look very, very nice. So let me, uh, let's, I'm going to meet you on a blank page here, and we're going to take a look at simplifying this out before we let our calculator do all the heavy lifting. Okay, so the first thing that I want to do in hopes to simplify this a little bit is... Um, take a look at that guy right there. And so I'm going to just work on this part without rewriting everything. So I'm just going to work on that square root part because I think there's some stuff that we could do uh, with it. So is it fair to go ahead and say and I'm, that we have the square root of 120 squared plus, and if I'm going to put this into both of those, I can get 120 squared cotangent squared theta, okay? Just like that. Now from there, I can factor out the 120 squared like that guy, okay? So the 120 squared comes out of here and here. And so now we have, I believe, uh, an identity here that we have the cotangent squared of theta. So, um, let's look at an identity that's going to help us out with that. And remember, if you forget the identity, we have sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. And you think about cotangent, you want cotangent to be cosine over sine. So, what we can do is that um, we can divide everything um, by sine squared, okay? Um, and that's going to give us 1 plus cotangent squared theta equals 1 over sine. So that's going to give me a cosecant squared theta. Okay, so my plan is to take this, okay, this guy right here, and let's replace this in right there. Okay, so let's rewrite. Okay, so there we go. And the nice part of this is that we can get rid of that square root sign then because, remember, there is any time that you're taking, say, the square root of two numbers, x and y, you can take the square root of them or move them back and forth through a square root sign if it's over multiplication or division. So therefore, I'm going to take the square root of each one of those separately like this, and that's going to give me, at the end of the day, something way easier to work with, 120 co... oops, not cosine cosecant theta, okay? And so, now let's start to put that back in for this part right here and see where that takes us. Okay, so um, from here, I'm pretty good with just uh, leaving it. Um, as we don't, uh, we got rid of a lot of the nastiness. We could go ahead and combine those uh, those fractions out, um, and when I say combine them, multiply them, um, and then add the uh, the uh, the or multiply the bottoms and do the shoelaces there. But I'm going to leave that as is for the time being, and let's go ahead and ask our calculator 
um, what is going to be um, a good graph of this thing. And so we can find out what the minimum angle or the angle is going to be to minimize the time. Okay, so here we go. Uh, we're going to go ahead and Okay, so this is what uh, the graph looks like of the uh, purple boxed um, uh, equation above. And so what we're going to do is that we look at this thing and we have output is going to be time. So this is the seconds right here. And this is going to be the angle. Um, in which the person, the lifeguard, is going to dive in. So it looks like that um, if we put this all together and say uh, that if the lifeguard is going to dive in at an angle of 67.38 degrees, it's going to take 45.231 seconds uh, to get to that person okay now that is super important however we have a little bit more to do because we've only covered this part of the question what angle uh, should you take uh, for the best approach okay so it wants us to also say given that you want to reach the swimmer as quickly as possible how far down the beach do you run and how far do you swim? And so it looks like it also wants this distance right here and this distance, okay? And since we have X, okay, we can take this part right here. We know that tangent is going to equal um, 120 over X, and we know now what theta is, okay? So once we know what theta is, and we know that from the other screen, that was going to be, what, 67, I can't remember, uh, 67.38 degrees, we can easily find out um, how far down the beach we run and how far we swim uh, just by putting that in, okay? So here we go. Let's find out what x is by plugging that into tangent. So I'm going to get tangent of 67.38 degrees equals 120 over x. And after we manipulate the formula for x, we're going to get x equals 120 uh, divided by tangent uh, 6738 degrees there. And that is going to approximately give us, well, it looks like even if we take it out uh, to many decimal places, is this going to be 50? Okay, so that's easy for us to uh, work about here. So if we want to know what um, this distance is right here, we just plug that in. So we got 300 minus 50, which is going to give us, that's, 250 feet okay good and so 250 feet and now we need to find out how far does the person swim and so D uh, we know equals the uh, the Pythagorean theorem we could go ahead and plug that in because we know that X is 50 here and doing out the Pythagorean theorem uh, that is going to give us um, 130 feet Okay, and so the new stuff that we got that was asking us is going to be right here, the 130 feet and the 250 feet. Okay, so um, if we were to put that together and say um, the following, putting all the pieces together, and I'm just going to verbally say this, is that um, if the lifeguard runs down the beach 250 feet and then dives in at an angle of 67.38 degrees, then swims an additional 130 feet, then they will reach the person that is in distress 45.231 seconds, and that will be the minimum amount. So um, lots of uh, 
moving parts to this one, uh, but at the same point, uh, it's a good problem that really puts things, uh, all the pieces together that we've been learning so far. So uh, that's how you do that one, and I'll see you in the next video. All right, in this video, we're going to take a look at uh, another type of problem. And uh, going over this is that it says you're an employee at the Hamster Water Company and you're trying to design a new canal from Hamsterville to Ham San Ham Cisco. Jesus. And uh, the canal will be above ground for some reason and uh, be built with bendable plastic sheets. The plastic sheets are 10 feet wide and come in sections of 39 feet long. Sensibly enough, you'll assemble them into a quasi-U shape with one section as the bottom part of the canal and the two as sides. So basically, these are 10 by 39, and we're going to fashion three of them together like this, okay? So that's going to be 10, 10, and 10. And the side view is going to be looking like this. And eventually, so these again will just be all 10 feet, 10 feet, and 10 feet. And then it's going to be by 39, which is going to be in this direction, okay? So whatever that, that side, the length of that side panel. And then we just keep building until we get from Hamsterville to San Hamsisco. So it says, uh, since you want to maximize the volume of the delicious life-providing water that the canal carries, uh, what should the angle between the two sides side pieces and the bottom B. And then it says at some point in the answer, trig identities may be, and I, I got cut off there, may be used. Um, and, the, and so we're, I'm going to go ahead and show you the, um, the way to do this using the trig identities, okay? And so um, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so the first thing that we wanna do is that we uh, wanna get um, a section um, volume of just this, uh, the three panels in the 39 um, feet that is going to go ahead and, and stretch the length of the panels. So what we're going to do is that we're, and we want it in terms of theta, which are going to be these angles. What, what should that angle, um, how should I fashion them in such a way that it's going to give us the most cross-sectional area there or volume if we multiply it by the 39 and so something that we need to go ahead and um, recall that's going to uh, help us out with this is that the area of a trapezoid is going to be one half the height of the smaller base plus the larger base okay and so um, we can see that this is pretty trapezoidal uh, over here and we're going to start labeling these uh, these panels out, okay? So one thing that I know is that if this is 10, then this side is going to have to be 10, okay? So that, that's sensible enough. And we don't know what the, um, the length of the, uh, or I should say the, the height right here. So I'm just gonna give this an H and an H. We don't know what those heights are at all. Um, and we also don't know what this little bit is right here, okay? And so our game plan um, is uh, we got to get this thing in terms of theta. And we're going to just work on this cross section and then we'll multiply in the 39 feet later to make it 3D, okay? So um, let's start putting the pieces together slowly. And so I would have the area of a trapezoid is going to equal, and so the H I still don't know, so I'm gonna just leave it as is, but I'm going to start to switch out some things as far as uh, X and, um, as X's go, is that the base, the smaller base, is this gonna be 10 feet, and that's this guy right here, okay? And plus, the larger base is gonna be 10, right? Plus two X's, and so therefore, I'm going to write 10 plus 2x, okay? And um, from here, I notice that um, I'm going to, and I'm just going to, uh, for, I'm going to uh, just rewrite this. So I'm going to put the 1 half into this and add up. That's going to give me 20, right? 
and so I'm going to uh, put the one half into each one of these and so I have everything multiplied out nicely and so I would have H times in this case it looks like I got half 10 plus X okay so um, that's not too bad so now what I want to do is I want to start to define X and H in terms of theta so let's uh, let's go ahead and take a look at how we're gonna do that so if I go over here and I start to come up with a game plan I don't want to use tangent in this case because tangent is going to give us this and this in terms of the theta there and that's two variables and that's not going to be much help so what I want to do is that I want to use cosine right to involve the height because that's going to give us theta and a 10 and then I can use sine as these X's here because that's going to involve the X the hypotenuse 10 and the theta so let's write those statements out okay so here is X and H uh, div uh, pardon me uh, defined out in terms of sine and cosine okay so I just lifted the triangles that are on the right hand side in the left hand side of the trapezoid and then I did them out so now I'm going to take them and I'm going to be putting them replacing X with 10 sine theta and I'm going to be replacing H with 10 cosine theta and so this is what we get next okay so um, that looks like the reasonable next part and now what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna use the distributive property and put these on in and notice now that I've written the area um, and really right now it's just the cross section of the area of the trapezoid we'll, we'll get the 39 in there in a minute um, and so we're gonna get the area with respect to theta is going to give us 10 times 10 is 100 cosine theta and plus 100 sine theta cosine theta okay so now um, what I want to do is that I want to pull a little bit of a slick move and know that we have uh, a trig identity that goes the sine of 2 theta equals 2 sine theta cosine theta oops ah, goofing that up uh, cosine theta and so what I want to do is I want to kind of rewrite this guy as uh, and when I say rewrite this guy this guy as the following so the next line we can do is a hundred cosine theta and instead of writing a hundred I could go 50 times 2 sine theta cosine theta I don't know I got uh, parentheses flying all over the place so let me do that so it's not confusing sorry about that and so we go cosine theta and now I'm just going to switch in the sine 2 theta for this guy and I think we'll have the slickest version of the cross section which is going to give us the area okay and with regards to theta is going to give us a hundred cosine theta plus 50 sine 2 theta okay and so uh, yeah that looks pretty good so it does want us to provide the volume okay and so the volume might be a little bit if we wanted to do volume okay then we could just multiply because that's going to be um, if we're just looking at one uh one section or, or three of these guys all three of the panels all uh affixed together is that if we wanted volume with respect to theta of one section we would just multiply the entire thing by 39 like that and i'm just going to leave that outside and notice oops 
um, that that now turns it into a volume because again the 39 would be stretching it if you look over here like that and that is going to um, create the the three-dimensional aspect okay because it does ask about volume there all right but the 39 itself is not going to as far as the angle it's not going to answer um, the, it's not going to change anything as far as the uh, the theta goes because it's going to um, basically be the the same no matter what you multiply uh, by it okay so let's take a look at a a, a graph and I just put this um, graph in the uh, the volume one and let's see what we get so we can answer the question intelligently okay the graph on the left uh, shows us a cross section uh, which is this guy right here and the graph on the right shows the volume and just to go ahead and take a look is that um, we have degrees uh, of theta okay and on the bottom here that is our input and then we either have a volume or area coming out okay so let's understand all these uh, these points of interest here um, we, we obviously have the maximum amounts that's uh, at the uh, the vertex of those uh, those graphs there so what we're looking at then is why does um, why is this zero 100 in this zero 3,000 900 okay so if we look at the okay so again looking at the y-intercept here um, the reason why it is 0 comma 100 with the cross section is that if you imagine we had this guy right here right and we had these thetas that were on either side and so if that angle is going to be zero okay that means is that these sides that are 10 10 and 10 are all going to fold up and you're just going to get something that looks like this so you're going to get a 10 by 10 uh open box and that's where that 100 comes from okay and you can see if theta if you so that theta is going in that direction now if we went in the other direction and theta were to go all the way to 90 degrees so that means is that we would have 10 10 and 10 okay and we would have zero volume because we wouldn't be able to hold anything right and the water would uh, come out the side so at 90 degrees that's where we had zero volume so it looks like at 30 degrees our best bet um, for this business of a, a cross section that's going to be 129.904 square feet is going to be 30 degrees so that's when the maximum is going to occur so at 30 degrees we're going to go and get 129.904 uh, square feet okay now in the this one right here and this is just going to be when we have uh, the cross section of the area for the volume, um, notice that the things that stay the same are, are going to be these guys right here, the angular measures. Okay, and for the same reason, but if you notice, we multiplied everything by 39. So if we had 100 times 39 over here, this is going to give us the. Um, it's going to give us the volume so all of these values right here the y values are going to be feet cubed so if we were to answer it with the 39 being multiplied in for each section that is going to make it three-dimensional the length of them that's going to give us at 30 degrees it's going to yield a value of 5066.249 feet cubed per section that we could put in so um, lots of moving parts there, but all good stuff. And uh, yeah, that's how you do the, uh, the second problem there. And I will uh, see you in the next video.